Good day, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to our seminar. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, so the, great, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority acknowledges the continuing sea country custodianship of the Great Barrier Reef by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners whose rich cultures, heritage values, enduring connections and shared efforts protect the reef for future generations. Um, welcome to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority National Science Week seminar. Um, this one, we're covering a very prickly topic. We're looking at crown of thorn starfish. My name is Paul Groves. I'm a marine scientist with the Marine Park Authority. Um, I'll be your host for this session. If you have any questions, at the bottom of the screen is a Q&A function. If you want to type them in there, we'll uh, go over to Julie towards the end of the, the seminar and try and answer as many of those questions as we can. Um, I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues, uh, Darren Cameron, uh, Dr. Jessica Stella and Thea Waters. Um, Maybe we'll start with you, Darren. Do you want to just give us a quick intro about what you do with the Marine Park Authority? Yeah, and um, thanks, Paul, and uh, great to see everyone uh, joining us. Um, yeah, I'm director of the Reef Intervention Section, and one of my responsibilities is looking after the Crown of Thorns Control Program. So really lucky that uh, uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, Foundation is, is funding the program as it moves forward, and uh, with our partners, uh, the, the Reef and Rainforest Research Centre, and ourselves and a number of uh, COTS control vessels, we're out there and uh, actively uh, managing crown of thorns on the reef, primarily to, to uh, make sure that there's plenty of uh, live coral cover out there and we've got a healthy and resilient Great Barrier Reef. Cool, thanks Darren. Um, Jess, we'll click to you. Do you want to introduce yourself and what you get up to? Hi Paul, thanks. Um, I been working at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority for over five years. I'm the manager of natural sciences and my role is all about ensuring that reef managers have the most up-to-date science and information available to them to inform their decision making. Cool, thanks Jess. And over to you Thea, tell us about what you do at the Marine Park Authority. Thanks. Um, my name's Thea. I work as a permits manager within the environmental assessments and protection team. So we um, manage all those activities on the reef that require permits um, and um, make sure that the process is easy for all those people that want to do things on the reef that do require permits. Awesome. Thanks, Thea. So to start this off, um, we might actually start with Jess, but at the same time, we're going to flick over to Reef HQ. Um, and live stream a crown of thorn starfish. And then Jess, do you want to tell us about this um, pretty little picture, Peter? Um, sure, Paul. So I um, have the pleasure of introducing the crown of thorns starfish. It is a native species to the Great Barrier Reef, so it's not introduced. It's the second largest sea star and it can reach a diameter of about 75 centimeters. They have between seven and 23 arms. And like most echinoderms, um, including sea urchins, brittle stars, other sea stars, and sea cucumbers, they have regenerative powers. Um, if cut in half, they're able to regrow the other half of their body in just seven weeks. They have a very prickly appearance, as you can see, um, and that is due to being covered with venomous spines. So each one of those spines contains a neurotoxin that's released into the skin if the spine punctures the skin. Um, if a human gets stung, uh, it can induce sharp pain that can last for hours, as well as cause nausea and vomiting. They're also notorious due to their diet of live coral, and this is probably of utmost importance to reef managers. So the juveniles mostly feed on coralline algae, but the adults feed exclusively on live coral, and they can consume half their body size um, of coral every single day. And at low densities, cots can actually contribute to maintaining coral reef diversity um, by feeding on preferentially faster growing corals and creating more space for the slower growing corals, so giving them a fair chance. So although cots are a natural part of the reef ecosystem, their densities can become so high that they can reach pest levels. And their extraordinary biology means that they have a number of life history characteristics that enable them to reach these pest level outbreak densities. One characteristic is that they have a very long pelagic larval duration. Um, that's about 10 to 14 days from when the egg is released into the plankton to wherever they drift with the current. So that can promote a really widespread dispersal along the Great Barrier Reef. 
um, once they settle onto the reef, they have the ability to grow rapidly. So they can reach reproductive maturity usually within two years. And once they reach maturity, they're extremely fecund. So that means that they produce large amounts of eggs. The average size female can produce between 29 and 38 million eggs per season, which on the Great Barrier Reef is between October and February. And the largest sea stars, um, which can get up to a meter, possibly producing greater than 200 million eggs per season. So it's an extraordinarily fecund animal. Um, all of these um, characteristics play into uh, making them, um, well, easily able to break outbreak, um, sorry, reach outbreak levels. So during outbreaks, cots become much less selective in their feeding. So they'll kind of choose on any coral and that is because of the competition. And that can significantly impact reef health because the consumption rate exceeds the growth rate of corals. The consequence is often a shift from a very diverse coral reef habitat to one less diverse with less structural complexity. And loss of coral cover or reduced habitat structure has wide ranging effects on all of the animals that depend on coral, such as fish and invertebrates. So combined with other stressors, such as climate change, um, coastal development and land-based runoff, crown of thorns predation on corals can exert a significant pressure on the health of the reef. And that's why it's in our interest as reef managers to do all that we can to control this pest species. Um, that's probably all I'd have to say about the biology. So if you want to move on to Darren, maybe you can tell you about the control program. Cool. Thanks for that, Jess. That was actually really interesting stuff there. So Darren, um, how do you control the numbers out there on the reef? Um, yeah, Paul. So at the moment, um, the main way in which we're controlling um, crown of thorns is basically by, by manual diving. Um, so we have divers that go down and they actually inject the crown of thorn starfish with either a, a, what we call an oxbile salt or household vinegar. And uh, basically it doesn't leave any uh, lasting uh, negative impacts in terms of the marine environment, but really toxic uh, for the starfish and they break down a matter of uh, you know 24 hours. So. Uh, that's mainly the way we're doing it, but how we do it is a lot of science involved. I'll just sort of briefly just talk about the program there, and um, you can see the slide up there, the objective of the program. Um, we're spoiled for choice in terms of, uh, you know, the number of uh, reefs out there in the Great Barrier Reef having over 3,000, but we were using best available science to try and protect coral at, at the key um, coral larvae source reefs, so ecologically important reefs, and also economically valuable reefs. So um, we've got a lot of important uh, tourism sites out there, uh, you know, really dependent on healthy coral, is, et cetera. And so we try and um, work with uh, tourism operators to protect uh, a number of those reefs and sites as well. Program orig originally started off as protecting just tourism sites but now we're recognising it's one of the most scalable and feasible ways in which we as managers can get out there and really protect coral cover uh, by, you know, you can see there, how do we achieve it? By uh, getting crown of thorn numbers below uh, ecologically sustainable levels so that, as Jess said, we, we want the coral growth to outpace the starfish feeding. And as she said, they do eat a lot of uh, coral um, when they're in the outbreak phase, when their populations are really high. What we're not trying to do, we're not trying to eradicate crown of thorns. As Jess said, they're natural out there in the Great Barrier Reef and in their normal uh, populations probably perform an important ecological role in maintaining the balance and uh, diversity uh, of, of coral species out there. We're also not about achieving a high body count. Um, we're about biggest bang for the buck that we got with our coral um, COTS control, sorry, our COTS control vessels out there in the marine park. And we're not trying to stop the outbreak. We're trying to suppress it over time, but um, it's about managing it to ensure we've got a good, healthy coral cover out there in the marine park. Um, people ask what the boats, what the vessels do. So at the moment, we've got five vessels out there in the marine park, and they undertake a variety of activities, some of which, as you can see on the right-hand side there, is the actual culling or killing of the starfish 
But in order to do that, we really depend on a lot of uh, good science. So with our science partners at the, um, mainly through CSIRO, James Cook Uni, U of Q and Ames, um, we've got some really great science in which we do surveys of the reef to determine uh, what the crown of thorns abundance is and whether we need to manage it. And you can see there, we also undertake a number of reef health surveys. And whilst these boats are doing all that work, there's a fair bit of support for a lot of the innovative crown of thorns uh, research that uh, we need to happen out there as well. So, you know, if we're still doing this in a manual way, controlling crown of thorns starfish like this in a decade, um, you know, we, we probably think we've failed. So we're trying to work out more innovative ways with our science partners. And again, uh, with the Great Berry Foundation funding that uh, recently been received, um, we're, we're looking at, uh, they're looking at uh, different innovative ways in which we can move forward. So looking at things like uh, pheromones where crown of thorns, you know, might be attracted to a small area and increased numbers so they're easier to manage, uh, things like that. Just a bit of an example, a couple of the reefs that we've worked on over time and how we've achieved um, really good things with our COTS control vessels. Um, here we have a, a reef off Mission Beach here and on the left hand side you can see in February 2019, um, you can see the red dots there represent where we've got an outbreak uh, numbers of uh, crown of thorn starfish. After um, our vessels worked there hard with all the divers over a, a few months, they, you can see there, they killed 4,600 starfish. And over time, um, they basically reduced that really severe outbreak level on that eastern side of the reef um, so that then we didn't see any crown of thorns. So, you know, it was a really good uh, outcome for a reef. So we've got, you know, luckily for us, uh, we've got a lot of examples of this sort of success. Here's another example where we've got John Brewer Reef, really important reef, um, for recreational uh, and, and tourism uh, use, as well as commercial fishing off Townsville. And you can see there, when they did a manta tow, they got three and a half crown of thorns that they saw um, per manta tow. So that's, manta tow is about 200 metres long, takes about two minutes usually. <clears throat> and as you can see there, that reef was in severe outbreak status based on the best available science that we have. Then subsequently, after a lot of work by our uh, Pacific uh, Marine Group, which operated at Townsend as one of our Crown of Thorns contractors, they did a lot of culling, over 40 something thousand Crown of Thorns starfish killed. And as you can see a year later, that reef uh, was really reduced down in terms of COTS numbers down to no outbreak status. So fantastic work, uh, but again, really dependent on the science that provides advice to us in terms of how to manage these reefs. One of the big things that we do differently from 18 months ago is we have to do repeat visitation. So imagine your, your yard, if you don't weed it, particularly in the tropics for 12 months, you get a lot of weeds back. So from a crown of thorns perspective, we're always actively working on these reefs and we, we've got more frequent um, repeat visitation back to these areas. Uh, just in terms of where we're operating, just in terms of, here's a bit of a map of the GBR, and you can see there in terms of the, the bright red circles, there where we've got still got some severe outbreaks on a lot of reefs, um, and in the central GBR adjacent to Townsville there, and uh, also we've got some um, outbreaks that were down in the Capricorn Bunker Group down off uh, Gladstone area. So um, these we've got five vessels operating up and down the coast, and uh, this is where they've been working. And again, um, really achieving some great outcomes, reducing um, some of these reefs uh, below outbreak status and also making sure we're maintaining some of these reefs in, in a healthy uh, populations of uh, starfish below what we consider that outbreak level. Uh, yeah, no, it's great work. And we're just so lucky to have um, the funding to support this really valuable work out there to you know maintain coral cover across a lot of these important reefs. Well, thanks, Darren. That's that's great work, and it's a big job you've got ahead of you there. Um, well done. Um, there, if I'm out on the reef and I see crown of thorn starfish there, am I allowed to um, cull them myself, or do I need permissions to do that? To do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so with the findings that 
that household vinegar can actually do a really good job at um, controlling the, the crown of thorns populations. Um, it's made it easier for just the general public to be able to themselves go out and um, do these culling activities. Um, and it's particularly great because that vinegar, as Darren said, does have no lasting effect on the environment. Um, in general use habitat protection zones and conservation park zones, so that's the light blue zones, the dark blue zones and the yellow zones in the marine park, you can actually go out there and do um, COX control yourself without a permit. You just need to make sure that you follow, we've got some COTS control guidelines that Darren's team and other experts have pulled together. Um, and those guidelines make sure that you're doing the COTS control in a way that's going to minimise harm to yourself um, and make sure that you're not reproducing um, or causing regeneration of crown of thorn starfish and just do it in a way that's been scientifically um, proven to be uh, effective. If you do want to do con COTS control on um, marine national, in marine national park zones or buffer zones, so those are green and olive zones. Um, you will need a permit from us, but that's not necessarily something that's difficult to get. We do have a routine permit um, that's available for COTS control. And they, they require you to apply through permits online. It's a quick process. Um, and because it's a routine permit, it's very streamlined. A lot of tourism operators use those permits to do site stewardship at the reefs that they frequent. Cool, excellent. Thanks a lot, Thea. Um, Julie, I might just look to Julie and see if we've got any questions there in the Q&A that um, we want to ask our presenters. One of the questions, yes, was, do crown of thorns have any positive roles that they play on the reef? Who would like to answer that? Jess, do you um, want to have a crack? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, during non-outbreak periods, crown of thorns do play an important role in maintaining coral species diversity. So they mainly feed on tabular acropora or other acropora and postulopric corals that are fastest growing on the reef. Um, by doing that, they allow um, extra space for the slower growing corals. So they kind of take away a little bit of that competitive advantage that acroporas have. It's really only when they get to outbreak proportions that that whole thing kind of um, caves down. But under normal um, densities, which are, are pretty low naturally, um, they can play a role in maintaining coral species diversity. Cool, that's great. Um, thanks for that, Jess. Uh, Julie, is there any other questions you want to throw to these guys? Yes, are there any natural predators to the crown of thorns? Very, very good question. <laughs> very good. Um, do you want to answer that one, Darren, or Jess? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. I think between Jess and myself. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, one of the, the giant triton, um, a, you know, a large marine gastropod, uh, it's been well known to be a, a predator of uh, crown of thorn starfish. And there's some great footage uh, on the Ames website where as soon as uh, a giant triton gets in close proximity to a crown of thorn starfish, the crown of thorn starfish, which usually don't move too fast, uh, really try to rapidly get away um, from being eaten by the giant triton. Uh, and so, you know, that's one of the things that the Crown of Thorns vessels actually uh, are assisting AIMS in terms of monitoring numbers. So whenever they see uh, giant trout and triton out in the reef, which we believe are in uh, greatly reduced numbers uh, compared to what they were, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, they record that. So they're an important predator. And um, those species of triton, they've been protected for the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And uh, yeah, really important for, you know, keeping the crown of thorns starfish under control. And uh, recently there's been some um, great research too, uh, led by the Australian Institute of Marine Science, where they looked at uh, uh, a number of fish species to see uh, which of those species out there in the coral reef environment might predate on crown of thorns at different stages in their life history. So a number of new species that they identified that no one knew that fed on crown of thorns, uh, including some that were commercially and recreationally important species. So, uh, you know, it, from that leading into the importance that we need, you know, good sound fisheries management, not just to support um, good healthy uh, reef fish numbers out there, but it's good to have some of these fish species out there in good numbers because they're likely to also play a role 
in uh, you know managing uh, the balance in terms of uh, crown of thorn starfish populations out on the reef. Cool. Thanks, um, Darren. Uh, I, I should say the innovative research they did in that way was all on fish poo. So it was looking DNA, looking at DNA of cots, and uh, they basically collected a lot of fish, held them in tanks, collected the fish feces, and then um, from that went on to see uh, whether there was uh, crown of thorns DNA in that fish feces. Fish feces. Uh, and obviously they'd done a lot of work back in the lab so that, you know, they had a good proof of concept that that was a, a good scientific methodology to use. So really innovative um, research led by the Australian Institute of Marine Science that really helps us in management. And a fun job too. Um, Julie, you got another question there for us. Yeah, we actually have quite a few questions coming up in the question and answers. So one of them is, what is considered to be an outbreak level? Well, um, Darren, I might fix you for uh, that one. Yeah, um, so I just, I might, can we just go back to that presentation? So on that slide, I just showed you, we've got a number of metrics that we use to determine outbreak status. And uh, I'm just trying to go back. Um, and as you can see there at the bottom of this slide, um, you can see there, that uh, we've got average numbers of crown of thorns per manta toe on the left. So as you can see there, um, if we've got greater than one crown of thorns that we see in, in a manta toe, one of the metrics we use, that's a severe outbreak. Um, if it's uh, you know, greater than 0.22 crown of thorns that we see, we class that as an established outbreak. And as you can see, we go down to the no outbreak status. So we really wanna get less than 0.1 of a crown of thorns that we see in a 200 meter, you know, approximately two minute manito, that's what we're aiming to get down to when we do the control activities out on the reef. You can see in this instance, we talked about Eddy Reef, um, we've got 0.31 crown of thorns per manito, um, and that's seen as that established outbreak, you know, just below severe, but just the established. And then we get down to zero crown of thorns after we've actively managed and controlled that reefs. John Brewer situation, which I talked about before, as you can see, it was 3.5 crown of thorns, you know, per manatee. So it was 10 times the density of crown of thorns uh, on John Brewer than on Eddy Reef when we first started managing that reef. And again, that's why we've had to, uh, our COTS control vessels have to work very hard to get those numbers of crown of thorns right down and they got it down to below that 0.1, so down to the 0.08 crown of thorns per outbreak. And then we can look at that reef and make sure that, yeah, we've, we've achieved what we need to. So again, back to that aim at the beginning, so that uh, uh, coral growth outpaces the predation on coral by the crown of thorns starfish. Cool. Thanks, Darren. Julie, what else have we got for us? Okay, this one is for Darren, and it says, can Darren please provide a bit more detail of the science that's used to select the reefs and the target locations? Yeah, so we're, we're really lucky to have a great partnership with all of our uh, science providers um, and the National Environment Science Program. And I mentioned some of those institutions before that feed into that. Um, we're lucky we have um, a, a fair bit of, uh, and it's scientific modelling based on the best available data that we have looking at the connectivity that we have between different reefs. So, you know, th this is a really important reef here. It provides a lot of uh, baby coral larvae that then move out and populate a number of other reefs. And, you know, that's considered like, you know, the, the word super spreader gets, gets used a fair bit. That, that's a great spreading reef for coral. And also, uh, you know, we've got a fair bit of information in terms of uh, whether those, which reefs are important for distributing um, crown of thorns larvae. And as Jess said before, um, one of the things we're mindful of them being um, successful is that they have a long pelagic um, life history. They're a long time alive in the water column before they settle. So we've got a lot of modeling data over a number of years and that helps us narrow down the importance of different reefs. We then look at uh, other data such as we talked about before from a, that's the ecological perspective. We look at from an economic perspective um, in terms of importance to tourism reefs, and we gradually narrow down the number of re the reefs that we think we should be prioritising to get the biggest bang for buck to address that 
ecological and economic objective. That's what we try to do. Um, at the same time, then we'll then subsequently work in with the COTS control providers and think about logistically, is this reef at a depth that can be adequately managed? Is it exposed to severe um, wave action uh, most of the time because it's on the edge of the reef? So all those factors then come in as we isolate the number of reefs down so we can get biggest bang for the buck with the resources that we have across all of the, the GBR. Cool. Thanks, Darren. And I guess with, with 3,000 reefs out there, um, keeping a handle of what's going on in each of the reefs is important. Um, Garumba has the uh, Eye on the Reef Sightings app, which is um, certainly used for this sort of information as well to help providers have a see where the crown of thorns are. So please, if you're out on the reef, download that um, and use that to, to feed information into it. It does get used by the program. Um, Julie, yeah. what else have you got? Oh. Um, yeah, this one goes back about the predators of crown of thorns. So you mentioned about a snail that was a predator. So the question was, why are the snail numbers down and are there predators of them? Um, so in terms of giant triton, there's a fair bit of uh, anecdotal historical evidence that in the 50s and 60s, um, that giant tritons were, were harvested in very large numbers of, of bycatch in commercial fishing industries. Um, and they were subsequently protected. I think the fishing industry had a fair bit to do with that protection back then because they thought, oh, a lot of these um, giant tritons are being caught. Um, you know, is this sustainable? And so uh, over time, um, they, were, they were pretty well quickly protected. I think they were one of the first animals protected in the 1970s, the giant triton under Queensland fisheries legislation back then. But, you know, there's stories of, uh, you know, hundreds of these um, animals being on uh, landing on, on shore from commercial fishing vessels for their ornamental value um, back, in the, back in the 60s. And since that time, um, looking at the life history of them in, in terms of uh, their longevity out on the reef, um, you know, the numbers have not bounced back despite them being protected for a really long period of time. Thanks, Darren. Okay, Julie, what else have you got? Someone is asking if there was any online course or training or information about, available about the science of cot removal using the vinegar method. Um, I, we, we haven't got an online training as such. Um, you know, there's, if people can look at the Gabrumpa website and they can see there that there's, a, there's a, a number of different materials that they can refer to, bringing them up to date, like all this information that we're talking about. Um, we have a COT strategic management framework work that we've just published. Um, and then there's the, the guidelines that uh, Thea referred to um, before. But we haven't got an actual online uh, video uh, example of, of how to do it at the present time. Thanks, Darren. Julie, back to you. Okay, keeping going. So is there any, in, sorry, has any scientific research found any uses for cots and also can you eat them? Two questions there. Je that, might be, that might be good. Yes, I've talked enough. Uh, Jess? Yeah. Yeah, Jess, do you want to answer that one? Um, you got any good recipes? I guess I guess you could eat them. I don't know why you would want to. I can't imagine them tasting very well. They don't have a lot of flesh to them. They have a water vascular system. So a lot of their body cavity is just seawater. Um, I, I can't think of any reason why they would be useful to science. Um, I mean, stars and stripes puffer fish like them, as we've talked about with the uh, Ames um, research in terms of uh, what fish, but there's, there's, there's other fish that uh, spangled emperor, for instance, like eating them. In terms of use, um, we do get an inquiry every now and then. Oh, you know, there's lots of them out there and I, I want to assist the marine environment to be healthy out there on the GBR. What, what, where, where can I get rid of them sort of thing? But um, at, at this time, I'm unaware of um, any demand or, or use for them for any um, good purpose, other than the role that they play in uh, you know, maintaining the ecological health of the Great Barrier Reef when their numbers are, are, are at normal levels. Thanks, Darren. Julie, what else have you got? So this one's to Jess. Um, someone was interested in knowing what you studied to become a doctor. So what sort of science were you doing? 
Um, I did my PhD at JCU in Townsville, and I looked at the effects of climate change on coral-associated invertebrates. So it didn't include cots, but it includes um, one of the animals that actually can protect a coral home against a cot's predator, which are the coral guard crabs of the species uh, Trapezia, uh, the genus Trapezia. So there's a few species on the GBR. They live in branching coral their entire lives, and they actively defend their coral host from predation by, by crown of thorns by pinching their tube feet off, and they can actually break their spines off. And crabs are only about a centimeter wide compared to you know, at least a half a meter for a crown of thorns. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I did my thesis on. And uh, that was yeah, a few years ago now, but I still have uh, a healthy respect for the coral guard crabs and the important role that they do on the reef. Excellent, thanks Jess. Julie, next question. So, now we have another question, it was to Thea then. So they're wondering about your career and, and did you study do studies as well? Um, yes, I did. I also studied at James Cook University where I did my undergraduate and my master's in marine biology and ecology. Um, and following that, I've I moved on to um, Gabrumpa and have worked in the same um, section, but different roles within the section for the last five years. So um, mainly permits with a marine background. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Thea. Julie, next question. So apart from culling cots, are there any other ways that we can help to control the outbreak numbers? Um, any, other, any other ways apart from killing the crown of thorns? Yes. Is there any things that people can do to help? Um, oh, look, uh, any, anything that anyone does in terms of contributing to a, a healthy Great Barrier Reef environment um, you know, contributes to, you know, uh, a healthy system, including the crown of thorns numbers. So, you know, best science indicates, you know, there may be some linkages in terms of uh, the crown of thorn outbreaks. Historically, um, we've had four big outbreaks uh, since the 1960s that generally start up in the Lizard Island to Cairns area, and then gradually um, progressively head south. And so we're at the end of that, I think the fourth sort of big outbreak now um, as it goes through the central GBR. Uh, in terms of what you can do, um, obviously uh, there's a bit of a connection. Uh, the science indicates between good um, catchment management on land uh, in terms of nutrient outflow. So, um, you know, all the farming communities um, along the GBR are really mindful of the importance of their improved agricultural practices that um, is improving the, you know, water quality, reduced nutrients flowing into the GBR. And, you know, those, those, those farming industries have been in, improving those practices for a number of years and are, and are really active in supporting in, in that role. Uh, and again, uh, we've referred to some of the important predators in terms of uh, the um, fisheries recently, for instance, um, for a number of those species uh, such as uh, spangled emperor, Recently, there's been some uh, improved fisheries management uh, in terms of uh, total allowable catch limits that have been introduced for some of those species that are fished, but we believe also play an important part in uh, you know, reducing and maintaining uh, crown of thorns numbers. So I guess zoning would help that as well. And uh, obviously the zoning contributes to that, Paul, yeah. Cool, thanks, Darren. Okay, Julie, next question. Um, so I'm just going to ask the last two questions um, and, and then I'll pass back to you for final messages. One of them was, um, can cots be used um, as fertiliser when buried on land? So I'm not sure about that one. And the other question was a Reef HQ question about what do we feed cots at the aquarium if they eat corals? So two questions there and then after you've answered that, we'll uh, head back to Paul. Uh, I'm not sure in terms of uh, use of fertiliser. As just said, by virtue of their physiology, once they're injected, um, you know, they decompose very quickly and you're just left with a, a decaying um, bit of, you know, the, the body. And then you've just got the calcareous um, spicules, the spikes that are sort of left. So uh, uh, I, I dare say that, you know, there may be some opportunities, but 
they're so heavy, you know, when they're in the water and you, you've got to be very careful because they're the only, um, you know, toxic um, echinoderm that's out there on the GBR. So if anyone, you get stung by them, um, you know, you can get, you know, severe infection, et cetera, in terms of handling them when they're live in the marine environment. So I'm not aware of uh, any um, possibility uh, to be fertiliser out there, but I'll, I'll probably leave that to the um, agricultural specialist from a fertiliser perspective. Darren, we have, um, we have heard of people that have requested um, collection of cots for fertiliser, but once again, not our specialty area around how good they are as fertiliser. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess the other question there was, what does Reef HQ feed them? Did Jess, did you want to answer that one? Um, well, uh, it's been a while since I was at Reef HQ or as a volunteer in my early days. Um, I, have, I do know that they can eat other things. So they can eat um, bits of fish. And they're really remarkable animals in that if they go months without eating, they will not just simply starve to death. They'll weaken, they can grow so they can get smaller, um, but it would take a lot to kill them. So just feeding them a bit of fish can keep them alive for a very long time. Cool, excellent. Okay. Well, thanks Thanks for that. Thanks thanks to, to everyone, to Darren, to Jess and Thea for presenting. Um, and thanks to, to Jules for uh, doing the behind the scenes. I guess the key takeaway message from this is that crown of thorns are a native to the reef. Um, but when they get out of control, when they get into big numbers, then they become a problem, um, cause massive damage, which is, is certainly um, of a concern now that we have other impacts such as climate change uh, affecting the reef. Um, once again, if you do see crown of thorns uh, out on the reef, I do encourage you to download the, um, the sightings app on, uh, as part of the Eye on the Reef program. It's on uh, iTunes uh, and through the app stores. Um, and, and put those sightings in because they do use that information. Um, so that, that's it for this seminar. Thank you very much. I do encourage you to, um, to jump on and check out the other um, in the series as we go through this week. Um, and yeah, thank you for uh, being part of this, uh, this seminar. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.